Now, the shibboleths I've mentioned generally have their basis in traditional gender roles, but have carried on, you know, rather seamlessly into the fabric of feminism. Feminism uh, will not be portrayed here as some great evil, but as, as simply as a great revelation, a great exercise in pulling back the curtains and examining what's really going on behind the scenes of this little play we call civilization. We will not get mad at the wrench thrown into the gears for jamming up a machine that we're just discovering was there. We take the wrench out, we watch what happens, we record what happens, and we derive benefit from it. That's all we're going to do here. But before I do present to you these shibboleths to be deconstructed, we have to first ask an important question of biological realities and dependencies that men have. I mean, what predilections are we stuck with as men? The portion of the great Western gynocentrisms that appeals to biology cannot be ignored and should be explored in as much detail and depth as possible. If men are ever to understand themselves honestly and holistically, uh, if the measure that separates man from the apes is the ability to both comprehend and manage his instincts, then we ought to consider it a matter of great importance and even an affirmation of our masculine humanity to explore our biological dependencies on the opposite sex, mitigating and resisting these dependencies when it is of benefit to men and boys, of course. So as such, it becomes necessary to ask ourselves to what degree are phenomena that we've previously discussed before, like, you know, male mother need, entrenched into our biological souls, for lack of better terminology. And in embarking on such a journey, I speculate that we're quite likely to discover some uncomfortable truths about male dependencies on the opposite sex that may make us squirm and, you know, turn away in disgust at just how much we are dependent on the biological idiosyncrasies of the female. But as long as these dependencies remain ineffable, we will continue as men and boys to struggle along in silence with our millennially dispersed addiction as would a heroin addict with no knowledge of the physiological mechanism of action of the opiate on the body and brain chemistry of an addict. Quite frankly, the male-female reproductive process can be classified as a benevolent addiction, one that perpetuates us as a species, but an addiction nonetheless. And it's with that in mind that I cite the famous Hartle's Monkeys study. Now, this is one of my favorite psychological studies of all time. Uh, th this study has attempted to quantify motherly affection and its role in primate development. Uh, now, now, what Harlow did was to separate rhesus monkeys at birth from their mothers and provide to them a surrogate mother made of wood and cloth with a unique face that allowed the infant monkeys to identify as their specific mothers. And, and they were in fact shown to prefer their surrogate mother's uh, individual face over all other surrogate mothers. And also you had a comfort variable that was established. So the surrogate mothers were fixed with a warming mechanism. And, and the cloth allowed for the grasping of the surrogate mother, which satiated an instinctual biological comfort mechanism for rhesus monkeys. Uh, rhesus monkeys need to clutch and grab uh, uh, as, as a means of expressing uh, and, and deriving comfort from their mothers. And, uh, you know, all the videos to uh, the actual videos to these studies are all in the description box uh, for anybody that's interested in, in watching uh, the various experiments that were conducted. Uh, very interesting study indeed. The only thing that the surrogate mothers weren't equipped with was a nursing bottle, which was equipped to a plain wire mesh surrogate mother instead without the comfort cloth and, and the heating mechanism. And this was done to determine which factor took precedence of importance to the infant monkeys. Uh, was it the basic need for sustenance or the basic need for motherly affection? Mother is a bit of plastic and shaggy cloth, a doll with no life of its own but capable of nourishing the life of an infant. The monkey will come to depend upon this doll to satisfy basic necessities of life. Not only nourishment, but a deeper psychological need for comfort and security. In primate infants, there is an instinctive need to cling to another body, soft and warm. Food or security, which is motherhood's stronger appeal? Alongside a warm, familiar mother of cloth is a stark wire doll set up as nothing more than a feeding machine. On a cloth mother which has no milk to nourish him, but fulfills some fundamental needs. This experiment revolves around one simple question. Will the infant monkey switch his affection to a wire mother which offers food and life itself?
Only when forced by hunger does he loosen his grip and begin to yield to nature's most powerful internal drive. From the wire mother, he derives one thing, nourishment. No warmth, no comfort, no feeling of security. After feeding, he returns to spend up to 22 hours a day near the only mother he knows. From this inanimate object, the infant derives all the security and mother love he needs. He can, if also exposed early to other young, grow into a normal, well-adjusted adult. So, as you saw, uh, motherly affection was, was so much more of a priority that, that the infant rhesus monkey would wait until it was famished to nurse, to uh, venture over to the wire mesh mother and, 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 and obtain sustenance. And various other tests, uh, one in which uh, motherly affection, the role that motherly affection played on the mitigation of fear was introduced. Uh, there was a, a mechanical, uh, I guess, uh, threatening monkey uh, put, in, put in front of the infant uh, rhesus monkey. And whether or not the mother was there was what determined uh, whether or not the monkey would actually confront and physically attack and, and, and resist uh, the attack of this, of this uh, artificial uh, threat. You know, the fight, the, the, the fight or flight reflex was, was contingent on whether or not the mother was present. And in another test, uh, the, the monkey was thrown into an unfamiliar environment. Uh, where it was tasked with exploring that unfamiliar environment and, and again the presence of the mother determined whether or not the, the monkey could successfully explore these uh, these unfamiliar environments and learn more about the environment around him or her. So as you can see uh, motherly affection did in fact play a huge part in whether or not these monkeys successfully navigated their fears of the unknown and unfamiliar. But the part that I thought was was the most telling about this experiment was when Harlow introduced these the Iron Maiden surrogate mothers, and these were so called in reference to the spiked medieval torture device. It was just this, this, uh, this, this uh, man-shaped coffin-like device that was filled with spikes that someone would walk into. They would close the device, and 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 in doing so, impale uh, the poor soul who was who was uh, trapped in there. And so with these Iron Maiden surrogate mothers, blasts of ice water and spikes would shoot out of the surrogate mothers in order to simulate abuse. And the fascinating part was that it turned out that even still, the infant monkeys craved comfort so badly. I mean, they needed their mothers so intensively that they still would not let their mothers go even during these bouts of abuse. They needed to cling to their mother even when they serially abused them. Now, I referenced this study to highlight just how strong the ingrained need for motherly affection can be in a species that shares upward of 94% of our DNA. I cite this study not to definitively prove anything about human nature, uh, but to pose a question about it. And so the question that needs to be asked is to what degree are human beings, and for our purposes specifically, human boys, beholden to these same maternal needs? And does this also translate later in life to male mother need and courtship? I suspect the answer to this question is paramount to decoding the innermost workings of the male mind. Now in my video on male mother need and civilizational male draw, I talk of a propensity, uh, specifically in the uneducated, uninitiated blue pill male, to seek solace in the fantasy that there exists somewhere, I'm quoting directly here, that there exists somewhere, a kind, caring, exceptionally warm woman that will demand of him only what he demands of her. That is, you know, simple companionship and affection. It's a type of unconditionalism. He seeks the one pure woman who isn't with him for her own biological self-interest, this is what motivates men like Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant. Uh, we're talking about men who can literally afford harems, li literal harems of fertile, genetically fit women of reproductive age to instead pair up with one woman in marriage and take great financial risk in doing so. It stems from a desire to satiate and negate a weakness within ourselves. It's a struggle to push out the perceived negation of our inherent personhood, our attempt to hide our heads in the sand instead of confronting the fact that the entire universe I mean, the entire universe is quite all right with male suffering. No group of people, you know, not men, not women or anyone, likes to confront an ingrained inability for its society's penchant for dehumanizing them. Instead of accepting this, we, you know, men, seek an exception that isn't there, and the closest comparison that most men have to a woman that never did judge them on their utility is their mother. So on some subconscious level, we look for a mother within the woman and within the wife. 
The point of me bringing this up is because for men and boys to truly understand themselves, for them to have any future at all, that isn't a perpetuation of some gynocentrism, we need to understand our weakness, our biological predispositions to remain servile to the human female. It's a matter of necessity that we understand this in much greater detail than we do today. Uh, studies need to take place. Accurate conclusions need to be drawn. I'm not going to bore you with some screed about how we just need to stop feminism. Those of you smart enough to see it clearly know that feminism is and always has been a symptom of a much greater affliction. The only cure to this affliction is to understand the primitive animal residing in the male mind and not cage it, not repress it, but to embrace it as a part of us. So, in terms of our biological dependencies on women, we know that young boys and the men they eventually become cannot be cured of this maladaptation. The trait will persist and there's no way we can extricate it. Thus, since it cannot be removed from the male psyche, it must be controlled first by realizing it is there and managing it accordingly. Such is not true, however, for learned behavior and boys, from the very beginning, are taught things about themselves and about women that simply are not true. Making an appearance on both the great gynocentrisms of traditionalism and feminism are certain fox truisms that exist in such a way that it will not suffice to simply let boys figure out the placements of, of the inconsistencies on their own. They must in fact be told, they must be guided and shown the lies as a father would explain to his son some difficult distinction that could only be discerned by an experienced eye. And this is where we can change. This is where the minds of boys are fluid and malleable, and so we have the difficult task of inspecting what I'll call the five monkeys scenario for the human male. Let's, let's first familiarize ourselves with the five monkeys scenario for, for, for primates. So, Start with a cage containing five monkeys. Inside the cage, hang a banana on a string and place a set of stairs under it. Before long, a monkey will go to the stairs and start to climb towards the banana. As soon as he touches the stairs, all of the monkeys are sprayed with cold water. After a while, another monkey makes an attempt with the same result. All the monkeys are sprayed with cold water. Pretty soon, none of the monkeys will try to climb the stairs. Now, put away the cold water. Remove one monkey from the cage and replace it with a new one. The new monkey sees the banana and wants to climb the stairs. To his surprise and horror, all of the other monkeys attack him. After another attempt and attack, he knows that if he tries to climb the stairs, he will be assaulted. Next, remove another of the original five monkeys and replace it with a new one. The newcomer goes to the stairs and is attacked. The previous newcomer takes part in the punishment with enthusiasm. Likewise, replace a third original monkey with a new one then a fourth, then a fifth. Every time the newest monkey takes to the stairs, he is attacked. Most of the monkeys that are beating him have no idea why they were not permitted to climb the stairs or why they are participating in the beating of the newest monkey. After replacing all the original monkeys, none of the remaining monkeys have ever been sprayed with cold water. Nevertheless, no monkey ever again approaches the stairs to try for the banana. Why not? because as far as they know, that's the way it's always been done around here. So oh, it becomes then imperative that we ask ourselves, what traditions and customs do we instill into boys? And are we simply perpetuating these traditions because we're vaguely aware of a past that a now defunct tradition or custom once pertained to effectively? In regards to traditionalism, I said in a previous video, quote, men and women are not lovers we fuck we make babies and we set up all sorts of customs and traditions around that and oftentimes the traditions become so thoroughly ensconced for so long that we forget why they're even there when we forget why they're there in the first place we can no longer judge when they cease to be useful and that is what happened unfortunately with traditionalism we created the lies of romantic love and chivalry because men needed to believe in women being with him because they loved them instead of because they needed them. And when women figured out that they no longer needed men, that they could work for themselves or rely on government to extract wealth from men, that little fantasy was shattered into a billion pieces, almost in a thunderclap. And so here we are, uh, the denizens of Western civilization, the five monkeys who barely remember why we bend down on one knee as though in worship, to propose marriage to some red-blooded woman offering her to please, please make us the happiest man in the world by allowing us to provide to her a lifetime of sustenance, slaves to our traditionalist shibboleths. So what are these shibboleths? Well, let's start with the home.